Hello friends. This video is all about making things, all kinds of things. So come and join me, but first, let's have a cup of tea. Hi YouTube friends. This morning I'm making bee balm. This is the balmy lotion that I make for dry skin. And I've made this before, and so I'm going to put a link to that video up in the corner. And you can go over there and see all the how-to. So today I'm just showing you what I'm doing. I'm melting my beeswax. And then I'll add my olive oil, coconut oil, vitamin E oil, and a little bit of grapefruit essential oil. Doesn't take much. And that will be a great balm to take to the farmer's market. I sell it every week. So, but now let's get on to some other things I've been making. Good morning, YouTube friends. Um, it's a little early to be up, but I'm in a panic because um, Sunday is Mother's Day. My daughter called me yesterday asking for my street address, which I thought she had, but she's sending me the Mother's Day card. And um, then I realized that although I've been anticipating Mother's Day, I hadn't actually sent anything off to my mother. So this morning I'm painting her a card. Let me show you what it looks like. So here's the card. It's going to be a kind of a three-dimensional card, I guess. Um, my parents, many years, went to the Cotswolds on vacation together. Um, that was just their very special treat. Not every year, but every two or three years they would go. <clears throat> and my mother loves the Cotswolds. She loves the little cottage gardens and the thatched houses. So this is going to be, let me see if I can do this. Maybe I should get out my tripod. That might be a good idea. So here is the card for my mother. Um, she loves the Cotswolds in England, which is a little area, a historical area, with thatched cottages, stone cottages, cottage gardens, everything cottage. <laughs> she and my daddy uh, visited there quite a few times. So this is going to be a three-dimensional card. So here's the outside of the cottage. I haven't painted it yet. And then I'm going to have this. We're going to take off these two end pieces here. This will fold up here. And it'll say something like, you know, here's your lovely cottage or something. I may even have a little ribbon closing it up. And then she'll open it. And on this flap down here, this square will be the cottage garden. And I, I'd love to include all of that because mostly my mother, she loves gardens and plants. I love houses. <laughs> so I'm focusing on the house first. Of course, she'll laugh at that. So here's the outside, thatched roof, little door. Um, lentils above the windows, that kind of thing. So she'll open it up and I'll have more greenery over here and maybe even a little, you know, shed kind of thing coming off the house. We'll see about that. Um, and then we're going to open up and have, now this is the fun part that I've been doing. Here's the kitchen. It's going to have a big fireplace like these cottages did to stay warm. And here's the sitting room over here and a little box stairwell that goes up. And here's a bedroom. The bathroom's behind this door, so we're not going to open that door, of course. So here's a bedroom. And then they've got an upstairs sitting room. Now, they call this the ground floor, and they call this the first floor in England. Okay. And then here's the stairwell going up to the attic rooms, um, what they would call the second floor. And we've got another little bedroom up there. If you can see the bed with the dresser and the lamp. And then this is kind of a spare, what well, they would call this a box room. I think it's because they literally put boxes there. It's always a small, very small bedroom for storage. Or you could squeeze a little a little cot in there for somebody to sleep on. So it has a trunk and some boxes and a little spare bed. And it's going to have dark beams above and dark beams in the kitchen and sitting room. So um, I'll show you more when I get it done, but I thought I would show you it in progress. I okay, I think I got the inside finished. So here's the ground floor. I love the fireplace. I like doing fireplaces. I think I've got everything painted and um, I outline most things with ink to make it just very distinctive. Um, and more like a doll's house. I love doll's houses. I always have. Um, this is like painting your own doll's house. So I've started on the side here. There's some blue sky. Notice the thatch. <laughs> and then I'm going to have a stone wall out front with a little gate. And then the cottage garden will be behind the stone wall. And then, of course, those will all be trees in that white space. But I haven't done really anything on, I hate to fold it in in case it's, but see, that's going to be the first thing. I need to paint the outside of the house is what I'm saying. 
I don't think that'll take as long as the inside. I hope this has been a, a very fun, uh, but a long painting project this morning, but I haven't done anything like this and I really, I really like it. Maybe I should do more. I don't know. Anyway, this is from my Marmy. I'll bring you back when it's done. Okie dokie. It's a little bit later, <laughs> but this was a lot of fun to do. Um, okay, so here's the card. This is how I ended up doing it. Um, it. I may do a little hole punch in the back and a little ribbon closure. I think that might be fun. So uh, there's a little note, and then you open this up and flip this down. And there's the cottage garden with the stone wall and the little fence and some roses and just a riot of... Um, this is not an organized garden. And then you have little stone steps going up to the front door. So there's the cottage on the outside. And then you open this half and you get to get a little peek of the kitchen and the upstairs sitting room. And there's some trees. I didn't spend a lot of time on those trees, but that's okay. Um, and then you get to see the whole house. So isn't that fun? I hope she likes it. It was fun to do. And it closes up and it will fit nicely inside of one of my envelopes. Ha ha. Okay. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and all the people who have mothered children in any way. You're greatly loved. Today is the day at last when I'm painting our front door. Now our front door um, has, I'm not going to show you the other half because I forgot to do this video until I already started painting. But it's got this big oval glass in the middle, okay? And it's kind of white here. And then the paint, the trim around the glass is... I think it's such a dark blue that it looks black. And it's been chipped and kind of ugly looking for a while. Well... I had some leftover paint from a, another project that I did. It's marine paint. It is tough as nails. And it is a very bright greeny blue. This makes it look more blue blue. But it's actually more of a, a teal. So I uh, taped off the glass. And I'm about halfway through the first coat. I'll definitely do a second coat. But I think it's going to look so much better than that. Yeah. Okay, I'll show you when I'm done. I'm making soap again. This is just a three oil soap. This is the recipe I always use. I've tried a few others and found no reason to deviate from this one. Such a gentle soap. I use it every day all over the house. It has coconut oil, olive oil, and vegetable shortening. I have to make sure to get the vegetable shortening. Anyway, now I'm waiting for the oils to melt and then I have to wait for them to cool to about 100 to 110 degrees. And my lye mixture is already done and on the back porch so it doesn't kill anybody <laughs> with its fumes. And it also has to cool. It actually gets hotter than the oils do in this little chemical reaction. And then I'll mix them together. This time I'm going to do, let me see, I'm going to do uh, one block of tea tree. One block of coconut nectar. I call it coconut mango because that was the scent I first, the, the name of it I first used. And this will be clove and lemongrass together, which is a great combination. So I want to do those three, three little logs, and they'll be ready in about a month. Well, right now I'm in our guest bedroom and uh, when we don't have guests, which is most of the time. I do keep my farmer's market stuff in here. I have various bags with different things for the market. But what I wanted to show you is what I've been working on, which is a new batch of soap that I made today. I've already showed you the scents. 
this is what it looks like when it is going through its gel stage. It gets dark and it's very warm. So I want to keep it covered up because the goal is for it to cool down as slowly as possible. To stay warm as long as it can and to cool down slowly and get fully cool. And that's when you get a really uh, a good gel stage makes for a good hard uh, high quality bar of soap and a good curing process later. The other thing I worked on today is this. I finally packaged up my double batch of shampoo bars. And, oh, I'm so excited to take these to the market. They'll sell pretty quickly. Um, they never seem to last very long, but that's a double batch, so it should last a little bit longer. Now, if you notice, I have something on my wrist here. Let me tell you what I did. I'll just go ahead and take it off. It's been there a long time. But I went out and did some yard work today, and something that touched me along here was very itchy. I don't know if it was poison ivy or something else. You can barely, I don't think you can see, still teeny little red dots. It was very red and irritated looking and itchy. So I put some of my healing herb ointment, or as my family calls it, green goo on there. And after I put a liberal amount on there, I wrapped a Kleenex around it and taped it on my wrist. <laughs> but, and that may seem kind of odd, but it allows you to put more on there than just a little bit of a smear and it, it heals it more quickly. So it felt so much better immediately. And then a couple hours later, I thought it's not itchy at all. So I took the, packet, the, the wrapping off and uh, then it got a little bit itchy, and so I did it again. And that seemed to, um, it's really done a great job. Yep, nothing at all now. So I'm, I've been pleased with that healing herb ointment for a long time. If you haven't ever made it yet, I'll put a link up here um, so that you can go back and watch the making of the healing herb ointment. I also have some footage I never did publish on that. I could do that as well. We'll see if it's worth publishing. If not, Watch the link. Okay. I'm going to make some scones, as they say, in the old country, as opposed to scones over here. And I'm using, I'm looking at Kate Jackson's video, um, but all of the measurements are all English stuff, grams and pounds, of, a pound of flour. I don't have any self-rising flour. But I do have baking powder. Anyway, um, I'm going to make a half recipe. So instead of three and a third cups of bread flour, the bread flour should be good. I'm going to cut that in half. can tell this is a day when I'm not in the mood to be exact in my measurements. Well, I better keep the flour out because I might need it later when I'm rolling out. Okay, let's see what else she says. Okay, so apparently to make my own self-rising flour, for every cup of flour, I have to add a teaspoon and a half. I'm going to do that and a quarter teaspoon of salt. So I'm just going to do like, like a half a teaspoon of salt. Okay, so that's supposed to be my self rising flour. Now this recipe also calls for additional baking powder. Let me go see how much. Okay, two level teaspoons of baking powder in a Oh wait, no, one, because I'm cutting the recipe in half. So an additional teaspoon. Now the low rumble you sometimes hear in the background is not a storm rolling in, it's my washing machine. Okay, so now let's go see what's next. Okay, 50 grams of castor sugar. 50 grams is a quarter cup. I didn't know I was gonna be doing math this late in the afternoon. I don't even know what caster sugar is. I hope that white sugar is what they mean. 
And I hope I'm supposed to actually add these things. Well, I'm really, I should not bake right now. I can tell. Okay, I'm going to say right now that this is not a tutorial on making scones. Scones. Um, and in fact, I would recommend that you not make scones while watching me do this or even after watching me do this. I just put twice as much sugar in here as I was supposed to. And then I took my little scooper and tried to scrape sugar out again, put it back in the sugar container. I did, yes I did, because I really didn't want twice as much sugar. Scones are sweeter than uh, American biscuits, but uh, not that much sweeter. Okay, now I'm supposed to cut the butter in. Okay, so 50 grams of butter is three tablespoons plus two teaspoons of butter, which is ridiculous. I'm going to put four tablespoons. Okay, now begins the part of the recipe that I usually don't like. I do this in a food processor or something because I don't like to touch stuff like this with my fingers, which is what distinguishes me from real people who love to bake. Because people who love to bake, they love to get their hands into the dough. And that is something that I have always disliked. However, I'm going to cut this butter in. I'm going to do this a la Kate. According to Kate's cooking. So, and of course, I will um, probably already in this video, I would have already linked to the Kate making scones video. It was fun to watch, and they look so good. Uh, she made, she used currants, I think, in her, no, no, sultanas, which is just raisins. Although, sultanas are yellow, they're yellow raisins, but they're Raisins made from white grapes, at least that's how it is in the U.S. Although hers look kind of more, a little more brown. The dark raisins are made from purple grapes. Okay, so there's the butter in there. Now I'm going to go look at her video and see exactly what I do next, because I don't want to have to do any more ooky stuff than I have to. All right, so this is when we put our fingers in the bowl and we squash. Now this is what Kate did. I guess once you get your hands dirty, it's okay. It's just the first putting them in there. It's kind of like going into freezing cold water in the spring to take a swim. You kind of grimace when you first go in, but once you're in there, it's okay. So we're gonna squash this up. It will be nice to only have one bowl to wash. Won't that be nice? I guess I could move back, stick my head in. I don't know. I really want you to be able to see what I'm doing. I think you've seen my face enough by now. Bobo is barking and the cat is quite interested. So what you're doing here is just feeling that all of the butter is in little teeny pieces and there's not any big chunks left. I thought this would be a nice thing to have along with our supper. We're having baked Penne. I was going to say baked ziti, but it's actually technically penne. I have decided to make Kate's recipe and not go for cheesy ones or anything like that. Now, Mary Berry says, and Kate says, to put a handful, it's a little bit more than a handful, a handful of sultanas in here. Now, usually when I'm baking especially, and I'm not in a very careful mood, I tend to put more of something, not less of something. And so um, my recipes tend to get bigger and bigger as I go along. Bobo is now in the kitchen with me. Oh, I said his name, and so now he's really looking at, oh, that was a sultana. I was trying to squash it up like it was a piece of butter, and it was a sultana going, no, don't squish me. Okay, that's nice and powdery. You know? I probably should have put a half a handful, but I don't have half a hand. I just had one hand, so I put a whole handful, whatever. Okay, now I've got to wash my hands again. Now the next thing I need to put in there is one big egg from my hens. This free range egg, I just have this horrible feeling that I've got too much stuff, but the milk is gonna go in there too, so we'll, we'll hope for the best. This is the biggest egg I could get. This one is from Henny Penny. She's one of my oldest hens. Big brown hen. Let's get every bit of moisture we can out of that. 
Oh, tell me she doesn't do this by hand as well. Okay, now apparently I am supposed to break this up with a knife and then use the knife to mix up the egg into the flour. And of course, that's not going to be enough to bind all that. So, after I've assimilated it as much as possible, I'm so excited to have there's a piece of butter. Sultana scones. That sounds wonderful. I'm getting rather... Now I really wonder if I need the, the baked penne for supper, because this seems good. Okay, now she says a drop of milk, and you kind of add milk, I think, as much as you need it. Do you want to see what it looks like now? There it is. Okie dokie. Let's clean up a little bit, too. Now she says a little splash of milk, and she continues to use the knife. Now, I don't want to put in too much milk. I'd say that's probably not even a quarter of a cup. Um, you're going to work it until it comes together. You want it to be in a ball. But at this point, you want to work it the least amount possible, I believe. That's important. Of course, you have to have enough moisture to bring it together. I think you want to handle it gently. Maybe just a teeny bit more. Now you're going to put this into the refrigerator. The reason you do that is to, um, you've been working it with your hands a bit, especially the butter, and you want the butter to be cold again. I should have taken my rings off. That's one thing about Kate, she doesn't wear jewelry really. And so she doesn't have to worry about dough in her rings, which is a pain. Now this is, um, technically speaking, a Mary Berry recipe. I'll put this in the description below. And of course, I've already told you, I'll link to Kate's. Okay. It does look a bit of a mess. It's only barely wet enough, a bit, barely, yeah, wet enough to hang together. Boy, just barely. But I don't want it to be too wet because the butter will dry or will unmelt while it's cooking, and that'll add moisture. Okay, let me go check what she says to do next. I think I put it in the fridge. Okay, I'm just going to cover this lightly with some saran wrap or cling film or whatever you want to call it. Stick it in the refrigerator for 10 to 15 minutes. And while it's chilling back down, I can tidy up some. And I can um, make uh, my penne. Now, if it interests anybody, this is our baked ziti that we're having. Uh, not ziti, penne, doesn't matter. It's the same base kind of thing. I put a little bit, you know, maybe half cup, three, maybe three quarters of a cup, I don't know, of just tomato sauce. And then a whole can of fire roasted diced tomatoes. Um, and put that with the already cooked penne. And then I've layered it in twice. I put, have a layer of cheese in there. I have some sliced Colby Jack, a generous sprinkling of this Parmesan, and then also a grating of this nice Romano. Um, and then I've done that again on the top, except for instead of the Colby, which I ran out of, um, I'm going to put a sprinkling of grated Colby Jack on top. And I've done this before where I, layer, where I have a nice, generous layer of cheese in the middle of this dish. And Adam really liked that. He loved getting to the middle of it and finding that it was creamy and not dry. So, now we're going to bake that. Off. I don't know if I can bake it with the scones because this needs to be at more like 350 and the scones need to be pretty high at 400 so but I'm sure we'll get it all done it's pretty early okay we're back over here with our scone dough scone dough now I have this camera balanced on two coffee tins and a spice tin um, so I hope it doesn't come crashing down if it does, I'll probably delete that. Although sometimes those that kind of footage can be fun. 
Okay. Now, again, as Kate said over and over again, you want to work this dough as little as possible. If you're making biscuits, a lot of times, oh, I hope doing this doesn't make my camera fall over. Um, if you're making biscuits, sometimes you fold it over and you're going for layers, but I don't think that that's the goal here. This is a half recipe. A little bit on top. I don't want them to be too flat. That looks about right. Now she had an itty bitty scone cutter and I, this is also what this is. I haven't got this one. Look at that little thing. It's fluted. I think she said you're supposed to use the fluted one if you're making fruit, but this is what I could find. The other one was a biscuit, real biscuit cutter and it's big. I think I'd rather have this size. She brushed hers with egg yolk, I think, but uh, I don't have a lot of farm fresh eggs because I only have five hens and I don't have a lot of spare eggs. She had a whole bowl. So I'm going to do what she mentioned and brush these on top with milk. I'm going to brush them with some kind of fat um, so that they'll brown up. Otherwise, you could end up with some pasty looking scones. I, I probably ought to use an egg white. I always brush them with some butter also at some point. We'll see how this does. But I'm not sacrificing an egg. And they're in the oven for 12 minutes and we will hope that that's enough. And then um, I'll turn the oven down and put the baked ziti in. And we'll have that for supper. And maybe we'll have the scones, the scones ahead of time for a little uh, appetizer. All right, they're out of the oven. Let's see what, and I'll be honest, I had to, I turned the oven, it was at 400, then I put it at 450, and then finally I turned it on broil for about the last three minutes to get the tops brown. So let me show you what they look like. They're cute, they're so little and adorable. I'm very pleased with them. So we're gonna have some of this while our penne is baking. Don't they look yummy? Adam's going to come in the kitchen and get some. We're going to eat them while they're warm. You really develop an eye over time for how much, how many strands of fiber you want for your single that you're spinning. This is merino, so it's very soft. It's not very crinkly. Um, the fibers do grab together, but not a lot. And so you need a good bit of twist to get them to stay together. So I try to keep my treveling up to a good speed and I try to leave a nice long leader 
between my pinch here and the orifice way down there on the machine so that there's lots of time here for my singles to get twisty before they go in and go on the bobbin. But what is really mesmerizing is just watching these fibers in here. It reminds me of, I guess, spinning um, cotton candy when you're a child or watching somebody else spin cotton candy, which was one of my favorite things to eat, although I knew even at the time it was terrible for my teeth. And you only got it once or twice a year. It reminds me of that. The merino is lovely and soft. I just got done doing a white roll leg, and the white is not as soft. It's more crinkly and a little scratchy, but oh my goodness, it spins up beautifully because it holds together so well. And you can draft it out. Um, if I pull this too much, it would actually separate, so I can't pull it much. That's why um, spinners talk about a long staple yarn. They like the staple or the length of the individual fibers to be as long as possible. Whoop, see, I got distracted and it pulled. So um, that was fortuitous. Let me get this back on here. Because if the staple length is really, really long, you can draft longer. Well, this will be an opportunity for you to, and you can see um, by looking at the single, but the, you know, there's not a lot of twist left. I mean, that twist came out really, really fast. But if I, um, let me give myself a good bit of leader here, because I really need to kind of retwist some of this here. So I'm going to spin again. I'm not really afraid of overspinning with this stuff. I'm really more afraid of underspinning. Let's see if I stop and I do this. You can see there's twist in there, but there's also, it's a little loose anyway. And the fibers are a bit loose from each other. So I kind of meld the two ends together. But I do have to be careful not to draft out too long. If I draft out, the draft is this here. If I draft out too long, if I pull it out too much, then the staple length is not long enough to keep it all attached and it'll separate, which is what you saw before. Some people seem to spin singles that are so thin that they must just be, you know, eight or ten strands of um, a fiber. I don't really do that. This is about as thin as I like to go. And then I will do a two-ply. Oh, I should show you what I'm doing. When I get to the end of this, I'll show you that I'm keeping a record of the order of the color blocks that I'm putting onto this bobbin. So that when I do the second bobbin, and I'm loading it up with a different order of colors, that I'll know ahead of time what the two bobbins have on them and in what order they are so I can be sure when I'm plying them that I don't get any uh, I guess you'd just call it duplicates, where I would have a pink and a pink being plied together. I don't really want that. I want um, I want different colors plied together. Stress when you're when you're using a nice wheel like this. It's a new wheel. It's a single drive. It's not very fast. It is fiber that needs a lot of twist. So if you put a lot of twist into it, it's not going to hurt a denny. Here's my card that I'm keeping track of the different colors that I'm doing. And um, I'm probably going to be done here, maybe after this pink or the next one. It's not really a full bobbin, but I don't want to run out of roll legs either. So this is how I'm keeping track of it. 